So I'm the project research officer at the Trauma Management MedTech Cooperative. Um, oops, pressed the wrong button. Uh, so I'm not going to go over this too, in too much detail because Fee's already given you a good introduction to the um, uh, to, to the mix. But our specific remit is to support the development of new medical technologies in order to enable improved management of the trauma care pathway from the point of injury through to stabilisation and recovery. So we do all the things that we talked about earlier on of helping set up collaborations, find funding. We also work quite closely with the other mix, uh, the signposting technologies that don't fit within our remit to them, or on certain projects we work in collaboration with the different mix to actually move this forwards. Uh, as all these also said, well, uh, we, we sit largely um, in, in this area of the TRLs from that sort of initial proof of concept up to the point where you've got a CE marked um, device ready to go to further clinical trials and to be commercialised. Um, we will then try and signpost you to um, other organisations that can help with the next stage of clinical investigation to start gathering that evidence that you need for uh, NICE and, and, and other organisations. As we come up around, hopefully later in on my later slides, we're also trying to get a bit more involved in this sort of early proof of concept stage. Um, and I'll come back to that later. My own background, um, I spent 20 years in academic medical research uh, before moving into the private sector for an in vitro diagnostics company uh, where we were trying to find alternative uses for their existing uh, diagnostic tests. And then I moved to another NIHR funded organisation called Horizon Scanning where we were looking for up and coming medical devices to provide uh, early notification to NICE commissioners and anyone else who was interested about medtech that was going, was going to be coming forward in the next uh, two to three years. Both of these last two roles involved a lot of looking for the sort of evidence I'm going to talk about later in the, in the presentation and also engaging with clinicians to find out their opinions on um, what was going on and trying to persuade them that, that there was some use in uh, these devices and, and tests. So I just wanted to take a step back and just ask, ask that question. The reason why the uh, mix were performed in the first place um, was partly to address this sort of question of why isn't innovative technology uh, adopted? I mean, basically, you've got this wonderful new device, um, you've got the evidence to say that uh, it's, 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 it worked really well, it's going to give an improvement on whatever it is you've designed it to do. I mean, this is not specifically for the medtech sector, so isn't it going to be self-evident why people are going to want to buy it? And this goes down, can be summarised in a, a, a misquote that's attributed to Ralph Waldo Emerson that if a man builds a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. Going back to the, uh, the mousetrap, apparently the mousetrap is the most patented device, there are more, more patents for mousetrap, mousetraps than any other device um, in the world. So if we've got all these innovative new mousetraps, <coughs> why are these ones still on sale? Uh, lots of varied reasons for this. Um, which can be summarised, okay, it might be wonderful, it might be more efficient, but we just don't see enough mice in, in our area to, to need to buy this. Wonderful device, it just doesn't fit in the location we actually see the problem with our mice. Wonderful device, it's ten times more costly than one of these, we just don't have the budget. And the age-old one, that's been working for hundreds of years, why do we need your new device? To translate that back into the medical device uh, industry, there are an uh, estimated 29,000 medical device manufacturers and developers in the EU alone. So we should be inundated with new devices that are coming through, bombarding the NHS with um, um, skills. How many of them have been adopted? Uh, it's slightly difficult to say because we haven't got reliable statistics, but what we can do is gauge them from the nice guidance that comes out. There's two levels of, of guidance I'm going to talk about. The Medtech Innovation Briefing is an advice document that gives an overview of the device, um, where it fits into the medical pathway, an indication of costs, but it's not given a recommendation for use. The medical technologies guidance is a much more detailed uh, assessment that looks at uh, all the clinical and cost um, uh, information that's out there and provides a recommendation for, for, for use. There have been 174 briefings in the last five years and 45 guidance documents in the last 10 years. So out of those 29,000 medical devices, at least 29,000 medical devices out there, there's only slightly over 200 of them that have generated the evidence that got nice needs to do this assessment. 
the sort of feedback we get from, um, from, from various sources is that basically there is no or insufficient evidence that this improves on clinical practice. And particularly from the funders, how is this actually going to make your company money? How is it going to save the NHS money? And these seem to be the bits of evidence that are, that are, are missing. So what does NICE actually need to do that assessment? Your value proposition for NICE is ideally would be something like this. We've got a condition here that's resulting in the death of our patients. We've got an intervention that does seem to be contributing to improved survival. But what we need to do is attribute a cost to that survival rate so that the uh, NICE can make an assessment. And the big one that they use is the qualities, quality adjusted life years. Um, we can also do similar assessments on if you're not actually getting an improvement in uh, patient outcome, but it's having an impact on service provision, we can do similar sort of uh, cost evaluations. The problem with this is that you need large data sets, and as uh, we've heard this morning, it needs to be um, published data as well. Uh, so we're, we're looking for uh, peer reviewed publications who are nice to be able to do their assessment. To be able to justify doing a study in which you look at all this and do a comparative study between with and without the intervention, you need to have actually demonstrated that your innovation is going to work and be effective. What do, we, what do we need to do to get to this point? How can you get any information to start getting down to this point when you haven't got a device that you can actually go and test in patients? Um, still on this one for the internet somewhere. So basically, uh, trying to assess, have you got a value proposition? What, your, what does your best prospect really want? What is the unmet clinical need that you're looking at trying to address? What do your competitors do very well? Or in this case, what's actually already out there? What's current clinical practice? What devices are coming forward to be able to address this problem already? And then what have you got as a unique point to, to actually sell? If you're in this area with the Me Too sort of scenario, um, if you've got something that's going to be more effective, more efficient, quicker, safer, cheaper, then you've probably got some, um, some grounds for actually moving forwards. But where you really want to be uh, looking at is something where you're addressing an unmet clinical need that no one else is addressing and, and you've got something you need to actually provide. Putting that back into how to actually move through the process, uh, this was a, 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 a representation that was present on the NHS England website a few years ago, and it just tries to give an illustration of just how complex the process of developing your uh, medtech is. It's not the nice linear process that um, we assume that's, that's present for pharmaceutical industries. I'm not going to go through this in, the, in a great deal of detail, I'm just going to focus on uh, this initial stage of development. We need to actually start saying, is it, how do we start building our value proposition? If you've got your um, uh, unmet need that you've identified, it's really useful at this stage to start engaging with the clinicians, the patients, um, and actually looking at what priority settings have been, uh, are already out there and published, to actually validate that you've got the right unmet need, that you're going down a route of something that's going to ultimately be useful. I say this because what, what, what we did in Horizon Scanning was when we found information about a new medical device that was coming through, one of our first things to do was to go out to interested clinicians in working in that area and say, if this works as the company are claiming it to do, would it impact on your clinical practice? And all too frequently we've got the, the, the feedback saying, I don't see how this is going to fit in. It's not going to work on our patients. So you've got the technology there that's being developed to a certain extent, and then the clinicians just aren't buying into to the use of it. I'll come back to that uh, in, in, in a minute. What you can then start to do is build up your um, health economic analysis, and again, how do you do that without actually doing the testing? Well, there we'd have to rely on what data is out there publicly. Um, there's an awful lot of information present that can tell you the number of patients that are affected by a condition, give you an idea of the sort of cost um, of, of, of that, and then look realistically at where the device is going to impact on that. And again, by talking to the clinicians and the patients, you can help to populate this information to create your initial market analysis. We can also get information from the scientific journals or clinical journals. Journals are now moving increasingly to, um, uh, I've forgotten the name, but open access publication. Uh, so the, basically the publication is paid for by the funder. So it means that anyone can go to the journal website and actually download the information. You don't need a subscription, you don't need to pay for the article. Nice guidance, if you're looking at uh, any condition that 
is already already has nice guidance or is <coughs> in a similar area to, to, to uh, uh, an existing nice guidance they will have information there on the numbers of patients potential costs but also nice have got a, a um, evidence search um, tool where they will, you can pull out lots of information and get your information um, priority setters like the James Lind Alliance, they've done a lot of work in, in a wide range of different diseases saying what the top 10 priorities are for the particular conditions. That will have a lot of background information to try and build this sort of um, information up. And then an important bit to do, and I'm sure everyone's actually doing this already, is to actually look at what your estimated production costs are going to be to make sure that you can actually generate this sales potential. But it's also when building that sales potential and that value proposition, it's being realistic about your entry to market and the, um, the market potential you've got. Yeah. Um, if you're going to just about make a profit if you treated every patient with a condition, it's probably not a very good um, sales proposition to be making. Uh, so it's something to, to, to start up and build to. And then something that's come out of um, a recent couple of meetings um, is we can also, it's also of value to try and talk at a very early stage to people like NICE and to procurement um, because they can give you insights into um, what they're going to need as evidence um, and how to build the, 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 your, your value proposition. Just going to finish with some examples of where we've had problems with development of products and some successes. So this is just an illustration that we know in abdominal surgery when stitching up the abdominal wall after GI surgery there is a risk of needles nicking the intestine, causing then further complications, requiring further surgery and further costs. One of the researchers at, um, at our hospital trust came with a nice simple system to try and prevent this. It worked, it seemed, well, it seemed to, 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 to be effective um, in our simulations. It was a nice, simple, cheap solution. It was a definite clinical need, but when we went to try and put together that value proposition, although we know it's a, a risk, or although we know the consequences are severe, there's absolutely no published data to say how many patients have this problem, what the cost is to the NHS, um, and basically what the market is going to be. So unfortunately this development completely stalled because we couldn't actually generate any value proposition because there was no information out there to build this on. Number one, central lines. This is inserting a, um, uh, a needle into the central, into, into, into the veins so it can deliver drugs directly into the blood system. If that needle moves into the tissue, injecting those drugs can have quite severe consequences. So again, it's a very clear clinical need to have something to secure the central line in place. The company came to us with a very simple, cheap solution to be able to, to do this. But when we talked to the clinicians, they said basically, I'm not using your device in such a critical situation until you demonstrate that it's useful somewhere else. Final one uh, on this one. Um, the company came to us with being able to produce a 3D printed cast that will replace your usual uh, plastic casts. Nice, light, simple, cheap um, uh, solution. Unfortunately, more expensive and more time consuming to produce than uh, a, a plastic cast. And again, the clinicians that we introduced the company to said it's a nice idea, but the patient population you've identified to start off with isn't really practical for the use of this and can't see where you're going to actually make uh, your value proposition. In both of these cases, the clinicians are interested, we've just got the wrong patient population to start off with. Um, and in this case, they've actually gone quite a long way down their development before getting to that stage. So if they've talked to the clinicians to start off with, or in an early stage of development, they've saved a lot of um, unnecessary uh, development. In terms of our funding successes, um, but going back to the bowel again, uh, if you get uh, uh, surgery that remove, removes part of the bowel, sometimes you can't actually reattach the ends of the bowels um, or the ends of the intestine. So the, the end of the intestine is taken out through a hole in the abdominal wall, and basically the waste goes into a bag. The bags haven't changed for, for decades. So a company came to us with a, a system for a new discrete system. Um, what we had was a lot of user endorsements. The patients wanted to have something that would achieve this aim. So we put that into the grant application, which was very successful. They had a very clear market potential uh, illustrated, what the UK size and global uh, market for, um, for ostomy was, um, and a very clearly defined route to market. 
Last one, this is a decision support uh, tool for uh, anesthesia. Basically, again, we've had a lot of user endorsements. The anesthetists, I can't say that today, anesthetists saying we want the product, that, or we can see the potential in this product. It has potential for use in a lot of different areas, but what they've done for the grant application was focus on a very specific area where we could get the information to say, this many patients, this much impact, this much cost, that's what we have the potential saving to the NHS for. And again, very clear route to market. So just to summarise, what we suggest is, as, soon, as early as you can, try and engage with the patients and uh, the clinicians, the end users of the product, so you can get that endorsement to help you to refine your unmet need and your patient selection. The patient selection might be for a case of, this is the patient population, it might not be the ideal population for use of the device, but it's the population where we can get the data together to build your value proposition. You want to see citable data, particularly if you're going to uh, grant applications to try and convince a, fund, a funding body to, to support you. Feedback from stakeholders, stakeholders, of course, is going to be very useful to, to say, yes, there's a need for this product. And then, uh, going back to Michael's uh, talk earlier on, what we can do is, you're building your initial health economic analysis from the published data, but we want to build into your project how you're going to collect more information as you go through the process um, to then get um, up to that stage of being able to uh, get a nice value proposition. And just as a final point, the actual quote that's attributed to Ralph Waldo Emerson is, if a man has good corn or wood or boards or pigs to sell, or can make better chairs or knives or crucibles or church organs than anyone else, you'll find a broad, hard-beaten road to his house, though it be in the woods. <laughs> Thank you.